Are you thinking of quitting your job? Or have you quit your job? Well, you'd hardly be alone. The world of work is seeing a reshuffle. Millions of people around the world quit their jobs during the pandemic. And data show millions more are thinking of doing so. Entire industries are finding it harder than ever before to fill up vacancies. And attitudes among workers themselves are changing. And so people aren't forced to work 40 hours a week at jobs they hate, for people they don't like, for, you know, jobs that it couldn't care less about. And I think individuals had a lot of time to sit and reflect and say, is my life trajectory going in the direction I want? So not only did we lose uh, workers, but we're, we're not getting fresh workers in. In this video, we ask, how has the world of work changed because of the pandemic? And is that a better world for workers or a worse one? What do workers want? That's all coming up on this edition of Business Beyond. Now, it obviously doesn't make sense to treat the world of work as a monolith, as if all jobs were the same and the experience everywhere was similar. In countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, and several others, job vacancies have steadily increased as the supply of workers appears unable to keep pace with demand. But these same countries exist in the same world as those that are experiencing the opposite problem, record unemployment, where millions of people found themselves jobless and unable to secure new work, especially women and young people. So it almost goes without saying, but your mileage may vary. That doesn't change the fact that the pandemic has reached every corner of the world, affecting life as we know it and work as we've done it. And that's manifested in unique and unprecedented ways. You might be working from home or you might be vaccinated and back in the office or alternating between the two. Or you might be thinking of even switching to another job where the conditions suit you better. Over the last months, you've probably seen or heard this phrase a lot, the great resignation. Well, here's what that refers to straight from the person who came up with it. The great resignation is a spike in the number of people voluntarily quitting their jobs in the U.S. that we've seen from April of this year, and we have numbers through August. So about 6.7 million more Americans quit their jobs during that time period this year than last year, uh, which makes sense because last year we were in the middle of the pandemic. But it's even 2 million more Americans that quit their jobs during that time period this year than in 2019, which was the highest year for voluntary quits on record. And so it's a spike in resignations that is a bit unexpected relative to the historical trend lines. Since he first used the phrase earlier in the year as a predictor of a wave of resignations to come, it's become ubiquitous. And it's come to mean different things depending on who's using it and where. Healthcare workers at the forefront of the fight against the pandemic were applauded around the world, but are burning out. The International Council of Nurses, which represents 27 million nurses in 30 countries, has warned that the so-called intention to leave rate within a year has doubled to as much as 30 percent. There's also been a spotlight on service industry and logistics workers, who very often with precarious working conditions to begin with, found themselves overworked and overwhelmed by surging demand after the economy reopened following a period of lockdowns. When we were all in lockdown and we're all buying online, manufacturing uh, goods was very much in demand. So we saw um, a shift in workers moving away from these affected industries to the less affected industries like manufacturing. But then as the consumer demand shifted back to services as restrictions were lifted, there then wasn't hospitality workers or or, or people to work within the service sector because they were very uncertain about the future of these jobs if there was further lockdowns. Um, and so, and they just had moved altogether all away from these areas. So then it left us with a huge gap when consumer patterns changed once again. Others think more of workers resisting being called back into the office after having worked from home and for whom anything other than a hybrid model of working no longer makes sense. So I think the great resignation is where people who have enjoyed being at home more during COVID 
and are going back into jobs that aren't offering them their flexibility are choosing to leave and do something else. You know, the, the, the title suggests that they're resigning and going and doing nothing, which I don't think is the case. In March this year, Microsoft released its Work Trend Index 2021 survey. That's a survey among around 30,000 full-time or self-employed workers across 31 markets. And it said that 41% of those surveyed said they were considering leaving their jobs. Not surprising, perhaps, because the pandemic amplified existing challenges around work. In other words, it became even harder to work. So you might have had this in your workplace. You might have, for various pandemic-related reasons, fewer people to work with, leaving the rest of you with a much bigger workload than you would normally have, which leads to your coworkers burning out and leaving, leaving the rest of you with a bigger workload than you would normally have, and so on. So the pandemic was unique that it kind of burned out almost everybody in some ways. And we know burnout is a predictor of turnover. But the frontline workers who were in healthcare, retail, food service during the pandemic were reporting high levels of burnout. Organizational managers and executives who were leading their organizations through the pandemic were really stressed. And although there's a lot of upsides to remote work, there were many caregivers who were juggling responsibilities personally, professionally, childcare and so forth that were reporting high levels of burnout. At the same time, border closures and COVID restrictions hampered migration, meaning there were just fewer workers around, especially in industrialized nations, as it became harder to travel to them. Seen quite a lot of disruption to migrant inflow. So a lot of countries around the world are very dependent on migrant labor to be able to conduct the activities that they want to uh, conduct. And so uh, in the, at the start of the pandemic, we saw outflows of migrant workers, but we also have seen across the pandemic disruptions, continued disruption to the inflows of migrant workers. So not only did we lose uh, workers, but we're, we're not getting fresh workers in. And that means companies are having to dig deeper into their pockets to retain people or recruit them in the first place. You so see, the major impact of labor shortages is the upward pressure on wage growth. Um, so that is the immediate impact of the labor shortage that we're seeing. We see many countries are having to, or many companies are having to um, bring with hiring large bonuses to, uh, to lure people to the professions or, or just to find any workers at all. That's good news for workers. And in fact, the current moment of labor shortages and elevated resignations are being framed as a moment where in-demand workers find themselves with more leverage, bargaining power, and motivation to organize. Workers at Starbucks, for example, voted to unionize for the first time in the U.S. That's triggered hopes of a revitalized labor movement in the country. But some experts fear that not all the positive gains may stick. Rising wages, for one, may eventually level off. And if they are granted more wages, where is that passed on to? And the data at the moment, given the levels of inflation that we're experiencing, suggests it's being passed on to the customers. Once we move out of the transition phase that we're in into something more permanent, everything suggests that more people are actually going to be at home. So probably a lesser demand for the services that are experiencing the, the wage increases at the moment. Worth noting that not everything is about pay. The pandemic forced changes to the shape of working life enabled by technology. And not everyone is willing to revert back to the way things used to be. Here in Europe, a survey of 14,000 people from December showed that only 14% of European workers want to come back to in-office work from 9 to 5. Experts predict that that will mean companies who do want physical presence may have to pay extra for it, but that in turn could have unintended consequences. Some companies who can afford to pay um, will give compensating differentials just to bring people back into the office, right? So if you, if, you, if, you, if you take this whole process through, if the women who are leaving organizations that value presenteeism and being in the office are the ones that value flexibility and hybrid working, and they find a home in another company, probably with less pay because you pay a compensating differential for hybrid working, firstly, the gender gap will widen and we'll wonder why, and nobody will really be able to nail this down because it's, it's impossible to nail down in data. In other words, some workers, say working mothers or disabled people, might value flexibility over money. 
They might not stay in companies that would pay to keep their employees in the office, preferring to take the pay cut. That could exacerbate wage divides and make companies with more traditional working models less diverse. But it's not just how much or how little flexibility within a job that has become more important to workers over the pandemic. For many people, the pandemic also triggered an internal reconfiguring of values and questions as to where work belonged in that new configuration. Do I need to be in the office all the time? Or do I even need to have such an extreme uh, dependent kind of job or a job that takes a lot of the time? So yes, we certainly are seeing the impact of labor availability if people are, um, are just moving away from different job choices or that they are just retiring early. That's certainly something we've seen in many countries that uh, we've got an aging workforce as it is anyway. I think individuals had a lot of time to sit and reflect and say, is my life trajectory going in the direction I want? Am I happy? Do I have a sense of purpose? Someone else coined the term pandemic epiphanies and I thought it was a good one to capture how people were reassessing the place of work in their lives deciding I want to spend more time with family after the pandemic. I want to spend more time pursuing my hobbies and other aspects of myself outside of work. In other words, the pandemic has gotten people asking themselves why they're alive. And for some, mostly to work, isn't really the answer they've come up with. You might have heard of the anti-work subreddit. That's a subreddit for those who want to end work, are curious about ending work, want to get the most out of a work-free life, want more information on anti-work ideas, and want personal help with their own jobs, work-related struggles. They saw membership surge this year, with posts relating to quitting jobs being especially popular. To give a sort of context to this, we had around um, 189,000 last year, in about uh, in October of last year. We now have 1.2 million people. Uh, so the uptick has been incredible. Uh, I think uptick is probably underselling it uh, as a as a moderator. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I was very surprised when all this was happening. I felt, uh, but at the same time, I wasn't. So tell us, what's your dream job? Darling, I've told you several times before, I have no dream job. I do not dream of labor. The pandemic has forced a discussion on the value of labor, but not just in a transactional sense. It's helped accelerate a rethink of society's relationship with work. Some have pointed out there's a historical precedent to a pandemic triggering a systemic overhaul. The Black Death, or the plague, is thought to have effectively ended feudalism. A drastically reduced population meant there was less labor to go around, serfs found themselves in demand and less tied to the estates employing them. And the gap between have-nots like peasants and haves like landlords eventually became less and less defined. That's obviously radically oversimplified, and not exactly what's happening now. But the re-examination of hustle culture in countries like the US, or the rise of the so-called lying flat movement in China, indicates that the notion of work as a good in itself is not as obvious as it once was, as rising housing prices and recurring financial crises make the gains from dedicated workaholism less apparent. To me, I mean, anti-work is a philosophy that is aiming to uh, ideally reduce to zero, uh, as much coercive work as possible. Um, you know, that coercive element of it is really the most important part. Um, and so people aren't forced to work 40 hours a week at jobs they hate, for people they don't like, for, you know, jobs that it couldn't care less about, um, and for wages that are unfair, usually in, uh, um, usually in bad environments. But the anti-work movement isn't exactly new. Here's Bob Black in The Abolition of Work from 1985. No one should ever work. Work is the source of nearly all the misery in the world. Almost any evil you'd care to name comes from working or from living in a world designed for work. In order to stop suffering, we have to stop working. Maybe not all the misery or any evil. In any case, stopping work isn't really an option for that many people, but stopping suffering and promoting well-being definitely is. There's more to life than just work. And there's a certain privilege in being able to say that. Families have to be supported, living costs have to be covered, futures have to be secured. But that is perhaps precisely the point, that in a fairer world, everybody should be able to say that. 
The pandemic isn't over, so it's hard to say how the world has permanently changed. But it's even harder to imagine things going back to the way they were. People are simply much more aware now that work is about the people who do it, and much more conscious about the systems that govern it. We have the opportunity to change almost everything when it comes to how we arrange work. Let's do it in a way that's fair and equitable for everyone and fix some of the systemic problems we had before the pandemic. And that's it for this edition of Business Beyond. If you enjoyed this video, please do check out our other content. Hit like and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.